Hey, Ed. Dan, great to see you. This day started with Mark Meadows of the Freedom Caucus admitting to me on Fox and Friends that House Republicans fumbled this issue by not getting the money for the wall over the past two years. He suggested the party let President Trump down. He urged the commander in chief to hold firm. Well, tonight, Meadows is saying that at a White House meeting that he had with other leaders, the president was serious about not folding without a fight, in part because, remember, back in March, the president vowed he'd never sign another one of these stopgap spending measures to kick the can down the road without new money for the wall. And conservatives like Rush Limbaugh have spent the last 24 hours telling the president, urging him not to cave, and Coulter warning he'll lose re-election if he does not stand and fight for a signature issue that fueled his victory in 2016. Well, I can tell you, as you noted, breaking tonight, House Republicans changing course at the president's direction. They've passed a new bill with $5.7 billion he wants for the wall, plus $8 billion for hurricane and wildfire relief. Democrats warning that bill cannot get through the Senate, so we're likely headed for a shutdown. But remember, 75% of the government is funded already deep into 2019, including the military. So this would only be a partial shutdown. And the president seems to be holding firm. Listen. I give them a little bit of an out. Steel slats. We don't use the word wall necessarily, but it has to be something special to do the job. Steel slats. I've made my position very clear. Any measure that funds the government must include border security. Has to. Not for political purposes, but for for our country, for the safety. I give them a little bit of an out. Steel slats. We don't use the word wall necessarily, but it has to be something special to do the job. Steel slats. I've made my position very clear. Any measure that funds the government must include border security. Has to. Not for political purposes, but for, for our country, for the safety of our community. There is not one person on the Republican side of the aisle that believes, if they pass this bill, that it will be accepted by the Senate. Not one of you believes that. Democrat Sandy Hoyer there. Chuck Schumer, another Democrat, charged the president is throwing the country into chaos over the wall fight plus a shift in Syria policy to remove U.S. troops that sparked Defense Secretary Jim Mattis' announcement late today he's resigning at the end of February. Schumer noted that Mattis was also not thrilled about U.S. troops being sent to the southern border, but Republican Steve Scalise said tonight the president waging this wall battle shows he has made border security a top priority and is putting Democrats on the record for what Scalise called is open borders. Dan? Thanks a lot, Ed. So as we get closer and closer to a government shutdown, President Trump is resolute. Today he announced that border security is a principle worth fighting for. Take a look. Our nation has spent trillions of dollars and sacrificed thousands of brave young lives defending the borders of foreign nations. I am asking Congress to defend the border of our nation for a tiny fraction, tiny fraction of the cost. In life, there are certain principles worth fighting for, principles that are more important than politics, party, or personal convenience. The safety and security and sovereignty of the United States is the most important principle of all. If we don't stand strong for our national borders, then we cease to be a nation, and we betray our commitment to the loyal citizens of our great country. Now with President Trump determined to fund the border wall, what will happen next in Congress? Joining us from Capitol Hill are two lawmakers who want wall funding. House Freedom Caucus members, jo uh, Georgia, uh, Georgia Congressman, excuse me, Jody Heiss, and from Virginia's 5th District, Tom Garrett. Uh, Congressman, thank you very much for joining us. I'll go to Congressman Heiss first. Uh, Congressman, I know the House Freedom Caucus has been doing an excellent job fighting for principles out there, and I admire uh, your resolute stance on, 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 on liberty, freedom, and immigration uh, control and border wall funding. But what's going on with the establishment Republicans? Why are they fighting this? We've had the majority for a long time. From your perspective, what took so long to get this done? Yeah, Dan, really, I don't have any, any idea to, uh, as to why. Uh, we, many of us have been calling for months and months and months. Let's deal with this issue. Uh, we have the majority. The American people sent us here for this. Uh, the president is behind it. Let's, let's go for it. And for whatever reason, it's been stall after stall after stall, one CR after another after another. 
And at this, this point, there was just a line drawn in the sand, and it was like, we've had enough, we're no longer taking this. You know, it, uh, it, was, it reminds me, Dan, down in the Alamo, yeah. there's a monument there, uh, but the monument is not there because they won the fight, it's there because they fought. And that really it was the line that was drawn in the sand with us over the last 24 hours, and it's turned out to just be an absolutely spectacular 24 hours, both for the Freedom Caucus, for our conference as a whole, uh, for the president and for our country. You know, Congressman Garrett, the Republicans out there, the activists, the people knocking on the doors, donating the money, doing the actual work that are sweating out there in the summer trying to get uh, people in Congress on the Republican side elected, they've been disappointed before, um, repeatedly. Now, to the credit, the tax, cre the tax uh, cut bill was excellent, but the Obamacare failure and other things. I see this as a political red line and one of those moments where we absolutely have to stand up for something. Do you feel the same way? Are you getting the same thing from your constituents? You know, look, one of the reasons that you're lucky you didn't win when you ran for Congress is it's disgusting to be in a town where a bunch of people make promises that they don't intend to keep. And some of us, Congressman Heiss and myself, haven't equivocated. Let me be real clear. The cost in human lives, straight line cost of not protecting our border, would equal the casualties in the Korean War over a decade. Over 10% of drunk drivers here illegally. That's thousands of deaths a year. 4,000 murders a year. If you then figure in illicit drugs that come into this country and kill our brothers and sisters and sons and daughters, and so this is truly about protecting America. I am for a robust and healthy immigration plan, but it is ridiculous and it, not, it flies in the face of a sovereign nation not to do this. It's tragic that it had to be done this way. Yeah, I agree. Uh, Congressman Heisel, this uh, exit question with you here. You know, the GOP loses, Republicans lose when we don't advance our principles. I, I said this last night, ironically, the Democrats lose when they advance theirs, right? Barack Obama did, did everything to decimate the Democrat Party and help Barack Obama. What do you think is going to happen on the Senate side? I understand we probably don't have the votes to overcome uh, a filibuster, but are there enough moderate Democrats on the Senate side to get this pushed through? It's a reasonable bill. Well yeah, it is a reasonable bill, and it's a great question. And the, the truth of the matter, look, look, we've already seen the, the Schumer shut down a few weeks ago. We are about to see the Schumer Senate shut down again because we're sending them a reasonable bill that defends our borders, protects American citizens. I mean, who would not be in favor of that? And $5 billion, when you compare that to $1.3 trillion uh, that we have in our, our annual budget, I mean, we're talking like a day, a day and a half of our budget to build this wall for security and the truth of the matter is the senate did not vote on this bill that they sent us it, they passed it by voice vote so we don't know where the senate is going to be on this but i the 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 reality is now that they're either going to fund this or they're going to shut down the government and uh, i just don't uh, that's a tough choice for them to be in right now. Uh, this $5.7 billion, Dan, is actually yeah. less than one day. It's about a half a day. Right, right. And I'm tired of fixing the blame. Let's start fixing the problem. We in the House should do our jobs. And if the clowns on the other side of the building want to fail, let them. But, but when we say, well, it won't get through the Senate, so we're going to abdicate our responsibility, I just won't accept that. Yeah, Congressman Garrett, I like your style. I like you too, Congressman Heiss. You're a good man. Hey, thanks, <laughs> thanks a lot for joining us. Thanks for fighting thanks a good for fight, us. guys. Mm -hmm. I appreciate it. On his radio show earlier today, Rush Limbaugh reported that the president will veto any bill that does not include funding for our wall on the southern border. Watch this. So I get this direct message. You tell Rush that if there's no money in this, it's getting vetoed. There's no money for a wall. I'm vetoing this plain and simple. This was the message that I just got. And I trust it. And I believe it to be the case. Joining us now with reaction is former Obama economic advisor Austin Goolsby, national security analyst Morgan Ortegas, and Florida Congressman Matt Gates. Okay, Austin, I'll go to you first. Uh, you, I, you know I always appreciate a good back and forth with you. You're always a gentleman. Uh, but we on this, have a fun time. Uh, we do, we do. I, as a matter of fact, I told the producers, I said, oh, great, Austin's here tonight. It's going to make for a great back and forth. Austin, a uh, simple question for you on this. Do border walls work as a deterrent or not? No, you know, you got 60% of the people that come to the country illegally fly here. They come to an airport. So I, I don't think that the wall works now. 
Uh, well, border, well, well, of course, a plane is going to fly over a border. Well, I think that's obvious. I think you know that, too. But visa overstays are a different issue. I'm talking clearly right now about illegal border crossings on our southern border. Just just quickly on that, do you believe it's a deterrent or not? I mean, would you if you were going to cross the border no, I, illegally, I you're a smart no, guy. I don't, I don't think it's a deterrent. So you would rather cross a border where there's, where there's a, a wall rather than where there was no wall? No, uh, what happens with the wall, as you know, is they get a ladder that's one foot but tall. But you'd have than, to go get a ladder, right? And they climb over it. But you would need a ladder, so yeah, that's a deterrent. Yeah, they have to go get a ladder. Okay, but so that's a deterrent. The question is, why did Donald Trump change his mind from 48 hours ago? He's yeah. The Congress people that you had on have been resolute. It is the president who has not been resolute. Well, I think the president uh, is, is standing by it now, and I care about actions, not necessarily talk. Yeah. Uh, uh, Morgan, let me go to you. Uh, Morgan, uh, hey, again, man. on this question, good to see you. Uh, we've seen the statistics and the data on border walls, where they've implemented strong border walls in Tucson and El Paso in these sectors. You've seen illegal immigration drop dramatically. Uh, right. where, where, where are the Democrats? Uh, where, where are they lost on this? I don't understand. Well, listen, I think the president has been very clear since 2015, I don't think he's been ambiguous at all, that he wants to build a wall. And I think what, in, what you've seen happen, though, the first two years of his presidency is really a failure from the top of Republican leadership um, in the Congress to get some of these big things done that he included, that he told the American people. And that's been the pattern of behavior that has so frustrated many Republican voters over the past 10 years. Uh, it's not just immigration that hasn't been solved. I mean, does any anyone remember repeal and replace? So what happens is, is, is that people campaign and win these elections based off promises, and then when they aren't delivered, when they aren't punted, then the, then the Republican Party base, the president's supporters rightly get frustrated. So the wall here, see, this whole discussion, it's, it's not even about a wall. Dan, this, the wall is a metaphor for will the Republican Party, will the president keep their promises? Will they take these uh, our immigration as a national security issue and take it seriously? That's really at the heart of the debate here is people People want to feel like what they are told that it will be followed up on, that there will be action. Yeah. Well, on that note, Congressman Gates, I've always appreciated your candor. You're one of the most open members of Congress. Uh, yeah. You don't speak in focus group tested terms, which I always enjoy. <laughs> but uh, your take on this, I asked Congressman Heisen Garrett before, what is going on with these establishment sellouts? I don't know any other way to sell it. Did they not get the message? Donald Trump ran on the wall. He was elected on the wall. This is a powerful issue that people want. Are, how, are they missing this? message did they ever get on Twitter or actual talk to real people out there? This was a rare good day in the House of Representatives because we actually did what we said. We kept the government open, we funded the president's border security agenda, and we provided important disaster relief for hurricane victims. But you know what, Dan? This isn't about the wall for Democrats. It's not even about immigration for Democrats. This is about denying President Trump a win on a signature agenda yes. item that he promised the American people. Look, 10 Democrats voted for the Department of Highway, or the Department of Billion Dollars in border security, which we can do on a bipartisan basis without building a wall that doesn't work. And when you see the president over 48 hours, the president of the United States put Americans over illegal immigrants, put the rising wages of American workers as the principal economic priority. And if we continue to do what we say, I think we'll see a resurgence in enthusiasm for the agenda of this president that is working for the American people. Yeah, I agree. Austin, uh, going back to you, uh, what's your primary objection to the wall, to the wall specifically, not visa overstays, that's a separate issue that, that requires okay. uh, a separate fix. Is your primary objection the cost of it? Because I've never seen Democrats object that's to part. spending money ever. But is, is that yeah. triaging your, your, your concerns? Look, is that number one? That's part. Uh, look, I think it costs $25 billion and it doesn't work. It's why the majority of Americans in the polls say they do not want a wall there. Let us invest the $25 billion in border security, which we can do on a bipartisan basis without building a wall that doesn't work. And when you see the president over 48 hours changing his mind, changing his position, and saying that, oh, it's not going to be a wall, it's going to be an architecturally pleasing steel slats, 
I mean, come on. What, what, is, what, what is he talking about? Austin, just one follow-up on this. If it doesn't work, why are you so concerned? I don't understand. If, if it doesn't work, because let the president it try it. Because billion dollars yeah, and it did, doesn't did work. You, did you lodge these same objections to Obama's $9 trillion in debt? I, I'm, I'm curious. Yeah, okay, okay. As you know, most of that $9 <laughs> trillion came over, left over from wars and unfunded uh, tax cuts. Listen, I, yes, okay. I was part of advocating how we reduce the deficit, cut it in half by the end of Obama's first term. Well, and I was I, concerned. About I, I strongly object uh, to the, uh, what, is, what is my cousin Vinny? I strenuously object. I strenuously object to the idea that the border wall doesn't work. But Morgan, going back to you. Yeah, I strenuously yeah. object. Uh, I, I don't, the facts and the data are here are conclusive. When you, when you talk to experts, border security people who are down on the border, and federal law enforcement, they are adamant that they need this. Shouldn't we take their word for it other than, than, than politicians up on the Hill? Well, I would always want to trust the professionals on, on the ground, and I think one of the things that has been just the most disgusting part of this whole debate this year is the amount that our law enforcement at the border has been attacked. You know, they, we've seen the Democrat, mainstream people in the Democrat Party who are going to run for president who are calling for the abolishment of ICE and for these jobs when we really need it the most. Listen, the bottom line here is the president is the ultimate deal maker, and what he really needs to do now that it's been passed out of the House tonight, we have to take this back to the Senate, right? So we have the five billion passed in the House tonight. We need to get 60 votes in the Senate. So the president needs to make a deal. I don't know if this is going to be DACA. I don't know what it's going to be to get those additional votes that, that he needs. But this is where we really need to see the dealmaker in chief come into play here to get this done. By the way, strenuously object is a few good men. I'm always awful with these uh, pop culture references. Yes, yeah, a few. Good. Austin, you should have corrected me. My you cousin can't. Vinny yeah. is one of my favorite movies. I mean, though, too. So How did I mess that one up? But Congressman Gates, uh, if this does lead to a government shutdown, the pre uh, president, President Trump, was very successful on the last one in his messaging. He's been very successful in getting this out in black and white terms. It's about border security. Do you think he can win this again? I think the president needs to assure the American people that when we begin 2019, the government will be open. But if he's got to ruin the vacation of every senator and every House member to make sure that we do our level best to fulfill this commitment, we need to rise above politics, Dan. This is about the security of our neighborhoods. This is about whether or not we're going to be a nation of laws that respects the rule of law or whether or not we want to be like elements of Europe where we just become overrun because we don't respect our border. So I think the president can win, but I do do think it's important in 2019 to not have an extended shutdown? I don't know what the Republican way out of that would be, but I think the president can certainly make his point in the concluding days of 2018. Austin, Morgan, Congressman Gates, you guys were great. And ladies, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thanks for your time. Uh, up next, we'll break down all the dangers of illegal immigration, including a shocking new study about a horrific murder committed at the hands of a criminal illegal immigrant. Stay with us. Welcome back to this special edition of Hannity. Today, President Trump spoke about the threats posed by an unprotected border. Take a look. Without borders, we have the reign of chaos, crime, cartels, and believe it or not, coyotes. I will not surrender this nation to the whims of criminal organizations who prey on the vulnerable, who hurt women and children, and who spread human misery and suffering. Every day, 10 known or suspected terrorists try to gain entry into our country. Every day, 2,000 illegal aliens try to cross our borders. They try. We get most of them. It's hard without a wall. Every year, 50,000 illegal children are smuggled by coyotes and criminals into our country. Joining us now with the latest on the immigration crisis and more is Trace Gallagher. Trace. Dan, police say on Monday morning alone, Gustavo Garcia Ruiz carried out 11 crimes, including killing a stranger and shooting at others before he was killed in a high-speed police chase. Authorities think Garcia Ruiz also killed another man a day earlier. Last week, Garcia Ruiz was arrested in Central California for being under the influence of drugs. When ICE learned he was in jail, they placed an immigration detainer on him, asking deputies to notify them before releasing him. But under SB 50. 
for California's sanctuary law because the suspect was not being held on a felony. Law enforcement is prohibited from honoring ICE detainers. ICE says this quote is an unfortunate and extremely tragic example of how public safety is impacted with laws or policies limiting local law enforcement agencies ability to cooperate with ICE. And here's the astounding part. Garcia Ruiz is a known convicted violent criminal, armed robbery, assault with a deadly weapon, repeatedly being deported, etc. But under SB 54, none of that can be used to notify immigration agents. Here's the Tulare County Sheriff. Watch. That tool has been removed from our hands. And because of that, our county was shot up by a violent criminal that could have easily been prevented had we had the opportunity to reach out to our fellow counterparts. Meantime, late last week, the Border Patrol arrested five illegal immigrants near the Arizona border. They came from Mexico, Honduras, and El Salvador. And the Border Patrol now says one of them is a previously deported MS-13 gang member. And finally, under a new policy announced today, President Trump will no longer allow people seeking asylum at the U.S. border with Mexico to be released into the United States. They will now be forced to wait in Mexico throughout the process. Dan. Trace, thanks a lot. Joining us now with reaction is syndicated radio talk show host Larry Elder and Democratic strategist and Fox News contributor Leslie Marshall. Uh, Leslie, I'll, I'll start with you. Thanks for joining us tonight. Um, in response to this story, um, do you have any objection to police fully cooperating with ICE in cases of misdemeanors and detainers uh, with regard to this law? It's clear he was let go because it was just a misdemeanor, but he was in the country illegally. What's your objection to that? Well, here in California, where both Larry and I reside, uh, th this is an issue where the majority of people that voted for Democrats uh, to pass and have protective measures against the Hispanic community didn't want this element in SB uh, 54. And if you look at the original legislation that was passed and how it was written and the changes that were made just this past September, um, I would say that left and right in the state of California, we agree that the police should be able to notify ICE when it is a violent individual. Here was the problem, Dave. And this is where we get into the gray area that is a problem with SB 54, in my opinion. One, he was held on a misdemeanor, not a felony. And two, he does have a violent background. So it is that gray area that can be changed, as we saw changed back in September with SB 54, uh, to address this without making the Hispanic community fearful to cooperate with police. If we look at 2017, rape and domestic violence reporting was down. And, and I think many in law enforcement uh, feel strongly that the Hispanic community is fearful that they would be deported but, if they cooperate. We yeah. need to have that fine line addressed with SB 54. Well, you don't need to get rid of it. You need to make the change so law enforcement can have these violent offenders picked up by ICE and deported. Uh, Leslie, one quick, th one quick thing before I get to Larry. I, I don't understand. When you say the Hispanic community, we're not talking about the Hispanic community. We're talking about he people here illegally. Like, they, they broke the law. They're in the country in violation of our laws. Why do they get a special pass? Dan, because they Dan, committed Dan, a misdemeanor. There are people, there are people in California that are undocumented, that came here illegally before you and I, and even Larry, were born. These, yeah. these people, but they're yes, here illegally, you call them right? criminals, they've been here for generations. Right, you, but they're here uh, illegally. Are you going to cough up the money to deport over 11 million people? No, but men, they're, women, well, I'm just children, saying they're here people, illegally, 60, though, correct? 70, we think we agree 80 on that. years of age. But, but, but they are, so, Larry, so, I'll go so, to you on if this. Somebody came to the, if somebody came to the United well, States illegally, Dan, you don't want them to cooperate with law enforcement uh, because you want them to be... We're not talking about you're changing the argument. You want them to have the stigma of being a criminal? Larry, I'll go to you. I'm just suggesting to you, Leslie, that although, yes, these no crimes are limited amongst immigrants. Not, obviously, not all people who come here legally or illegally are criminals. 100% of them who come here illegally should not be here at all. So, Larry, I'll go to you. The majority of them are not violent criminals. I, I, no I just talking, said that. No one's talking about mass... No one's talking about mass deportation. The president said and campaigned on getting rid of bad hombres. Clearly, this guy is a bad hombre. He'd been deported before. He was a known violent uh, offender. Uh, and not only does the sanctuary law require uh, the person to have been held on a felony, it requires the, an arrest warrant to be signed by a judge, which is also very time consuming. And this sheriff said, had this bill not been passed, he would have turned this person over to ICE and the crime spree never would have happened. I don't know how, we, how this border security thing became a left-right thing 
became a Trump versus Pelosi Schumer thing. It ought to be a national security thing. We have a vested interest in making sure that people don't come into this country illegally, that they're not drains on our society, that they don't compete against jobs for unskilled workers living in the inner city and put downward wages on their on their downward pressure on their wages. Why this is a left white thing is beyond me. Why we can't spend twenty five billion dollars for a wall when we spent almost twenty trillion dollars since nineteen sixty five to fight the war on poverty. We're spending all this money on climate change. And what do they say? Well if we err on the side of all the worst that will happen is we'll have a cleaner planet. Why don't we err on the side of paying twenty five million dollars for the wall? The worst that'll happen is it'll deter a few people from coming here illegally. What's wrong with that? Why can't we agree on that? Yeah, Leslie, what, uh, I agree, Larry, but what I don't get from you, Leslie, and I'm, I'm having a difficult time understanding is why you don't only get a pass once if you break the law and come here illegally and violate our immigration laws, why you get a pass twice? Uh, now that you've been convicted of just a, mi a misdemeanor or being held on a misdemeanor, why you get a pass? Let me just say, I, I, I stipulate your point. The overwhelming majority of people who come here uh, and break the law the first time do not go on to be, thankfully, criminals again. But that's not the point, Leslie. The point is 100% should not be here. They already broke the law. Why are they getting a pass again? But, but again, but again, Dan, you're saying 100% should not be here. Okay, so let me even just agree with you on that. So then what do you do? That's where we are today. That's where the problem lies. And I agree with Larry. It shouldn't be a left or right problem, which is why you guys should have been applauding Barack well, Obama when he was called the border in chief. Leslie, I'll I tell you what we do, right. though. But right now, right now, Dan, Le Leslie in keeps this saying, state, what, what do we, we do? Have what, more what do we do? Hold on, Leslie. We get rid of the, we get rid of the bad hombres. State. That's what Go we ahead, do. Larry. Respond. Go ahead, Larry. Wait, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait. Building the she wall said, what doesn't do, we do that. Again, How did, no it doesn't talking address about the 11 million people here. If you talk over each other, nobody can hear Comprehensive immigration does. All right. Hold on. Comprehensive immigration reform does. Larry, one more time, no one's talking about deporting 11 million people. And by the way, a Yale study puts a number at twice that, at almost 20 million people. No one's talking about doing that. We're talking about getting rid of, again, what Donald Trump called bad hombres. Clearly, this guy was a bad hombre, as was the, the person that killed Jamil Shaw, as was the person that killed Kate Steinle. We ought to be talking about doing something about all of this, and it ought not be an ideological deal. Yeah, uh, Leslie, you asked me, what do we do? It's ironic. What do we do? We get rid of this SB 54 law that's really ridiculous that when you commit right. a misdemeanor, you get another pass. So now we agree. Will you agree on the air and say, Dan, we both agree this is a bad law. If you're arrested for a misdemeanor and you're here illegally, you need to be reported to ICE and set up for possible deportation. Can we agree? I'll take a yes. <laughs> Uh, I, uh, no, what do you mean? No, no, you're just saying, what do we do? By the way, it was Dan who asked me about all <laughs> of the undocumented workers in this state. Larry, you weren't listening to the host. Uh, no, uh, I said it, that is an element that needs to be changed and that left and right in the state of California agree on. And, and by the way, going to you again, Larry, with your wall, uh, the wall doesn't address it. We need comprehensive immigration reform. And by the way, Dan, if decades ago, left and right, our congressional members slapped the hands of the corporations dangling the carrot of jobs and opportunity, we wouldn't have had people coming to this country for the opportunity and believing the streets were paved with gold. Well, Leslie, listen, my, my wife is a legal immigrant, came here legally. I, I get what you're saying here, but I don't understand when you ask for solutions and I say, well, getting rid of this dopey law would be one of them. And then you say, well, that's not really a solution. I, no, I'm kind it of does, that doesn't address the majority of the people. Need, you need, said Dan, the majority of the Dan, people that get, are here are not We need to get rid of the welcome mat. Criminals. We need to get rid of the welcome mat we have here in California. All right, we need Leslie. to get rid of the welcome mat we have here in California. Immigration has been declining every year get, for a decade. Illegal immigration has been declining every year for a decade. An illegal alien can get in state tuition. <laughs> Thank you very much, Larry, Leslie, you both were great. Appreciate it. Coming up, we have a new report surrounding Hillary Clinton's bought and paid for dirty dossier that you do not want to miss as this special edition of Hannity continues. Welcome back to this special edition of Hannity, Law and Order in America. Tonight, we're continuing to learn more about the infamous Trump dossier. As a new court filing says, it was an associate of the late John McCain who shared the unverified document with the news outlet BuzzFeed in 2016. Also developing tonight, NBC News is reporting that Mueller could wrap up the probe as soon as mid-February and submit his report to Acting Attorney General Matt Whitaker, who's been cleared by the DOJ to oversee the special counsel. Now President Trump's pick for the AG job, William Barr, sent a memo to the department earlier this year expressing deep concerns to Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein about Mueller's inquiry into alleged obstruction of justice by the president. 
Despite this development, our own Catherine Herridge reports that Rosenstein is still not expected to appear before House lawmakers this session. Joining us now for reaction is author of the terrific book, The Russia Hoax, Fox News legal analyst Greg Jarrett, along with attorney David Schoen and Republican Congressman Bob Goodlatte. Greg, I'll go to you first mm -hmm. on this Barr memo. Uh, you've read the memo. Uh, I've read the memo. It is a, uh, a manifesto on how ridiculous it is to charge the president or even think about charging the president for obstruction of justice on what is essentially a personnel decision in the firing of Jim Comey. I find it incredible the Democrats are in celebrating this memo. Your opinion on it? Well, you're right. It is, this is the document, a meticulously well-reasoned analysis of the law of obstruction of justice. It is not, as Chuck Schumer said today on the floor of the Senate, a reason for disqualification of Barr. To the contrary, it's actually a very good reason to confirm somebody like William Barr. And he lays out how the firing of James Comey is not obstruction of justice. The law is very specific on obstruction. I devote an entire chapter of my book to it. It has to be a corrupt purpose that involves a lie, threat, bribe, concealing of evidence, destruction of documents, or falsifying information. The firing of James Comey is none of those things. Even Comey grudgingly admitted in his testimony before Congress the president was entitled to fire him for a reason or no reason at all. So, again, the media and Democrats that say, oh, Barr must recuse himself or he's disqualified, frankly, they don't know what they're talking about. They've never read the recusal regulations in the Code of Federal Regulations. David, I'll go to you next. Uh, your legal opinion on this ridiculous obstruction charges, well, I think you know where I stand, given how I set that up. Uh, but this seems utterly outrageous to me. Jim Comey was up on Capitol Hill and was asked specifically if he felt he was obstructed in his investigation into Mike Flynn, uh, and he said no. Uh, the president also, when he, when he asked Jim Comey about the Mike Flynn case, said, I hope this can go away. He said, hope. He didn't say, make this go away. He in no way obstructed the investigation. How do we know that? Because General Flynn already took a plea. So is, this, is, is there any legs to this obstruction thing, or is, uh, is William Barr correct in his memo? William Barr is correct. It's absolutely outrageous. William Barr's memo ultimately is about Article 2 power of the president. And the irony is the previous administration exercised probably the most robust power for the president that we've seen in decades. Um, the idea that this should be a disqualifying factor is absolutely wrong. And we don't want an attorney general from Mars who hasn't given serious thought to serious issues like this. Let me say this, it's time for Mr. Barr or Mr. Whitaker to act appropriately under the regulations. Regulation, Special Counsel Regulation 600.7 gives them the authority and the obligation to demand an explanation for every inappropriate investigative or prosecutorial step the uh, Special Counsel has taken. It's time for them to get on board. The regulations contemplate a person who gives serious thought to reining in an outrageous Special Counsel. Mr. Whitaker, Mr. Uh, Barr need to do what Mr. Rosenstein has refused to do. Congressman Goodlad, with regard to Rod Rosenstein, uh, he seems to be living on a, in, in, a, in a government in and of himself. Uh, I, I don't know if he's some extra constitutional power, has been a member of the Justice League or whatever it may be, <laughs> uh, but Rod Rosenstein seems to just be telling you all to pound sand. Um, he doesn't want to go up on Capitol Hill. He doesn't want to talk. Uh, is anything going to be done? I mean, common sense people say, if I did this in my job, I'd be fired. Well, I hope that he has a, a short shelf life because uh, I would think that the new attorney general would insist on having a new deputy attorney general. We have wanted to speak to Mr. Rosenstein regarding this meeting that took place shortly before the special counsel was appointed. We've wanted to talk to him about his involvement late in the FISA warrant process with regard to Carter Page and, and a few other matters. We had it set up uh, in early October. It didn't suit uh, everyone on Capitol Hill and the timing uh, in terms of the amount of time available to ask the dozens of pages of questions we had for him didn't work. It fell apart. Uh, we've tried ever since to get him back. Uh, I would suggest that at this point it's uh, something for Lindsey Graham, the new chairman of the Senate Judiciary Committee, to take up and certainly should be something that the Inspector General of the Justice Department uh, takes up with him because he is right now looking into the whole issue surrounding uh, the Carter Page FISA warrant application. Uh, that actually should be expanded to cover a number of other things regarding the uh, so-called Russia investigation. 
You know, Greg, what I find ironic about Rosenstein, is there a more conflicted character in this tragic play? <laughs> he signs the fourth FISA after this thing has been widely debunked. Not only that, he is the prosecuting uh, United States attorney on the Uranium One case, which has obviously uh, been a political hot potato. Mm. Uh, how has he seemed to avoid all of this? I mean, he's a central figure in this entire scandal. Yeah, the Code of Federal Regulations that governs Rod Rosenstein and others involved in this, are vi it's very very specific. It says if you have a personal or political involvement in a case or with somebody else involved in the case, you must disqualify yourself. It's not a maybe or a gee, I might. It's mandatory. Rosenstein has ignored the regulations and the code of professional responsibility with impunity. This is a guy who's been interviewed by Robert Mueller, the special counsel, as a key witness in the case, and yet Rosenstein presides over the case? This is the ultimate conflict of interest, and instead of uh, accusing William Barr or Matt Whitaker of a conflict of interest, Let's all take a look at Rod Rosenstein. He should have been kicked off of this case from the beginning. All right, it's amazing. Everybody wants recusals except Ro Rosenstein. <laughs> right. Democrat side. Gentlemen, thanks a lot for joining me. I really appreciate it. After the break, one Democratic congressman had a Christmas theme, yes, Christmas theme meltdown on Capitol Hill. We'll show you the tape. You don't want to miss it. Stay with us. Welcome back to a special edition of Hannity, Law and Order in America. The Trump administration is hard at work trying to secure the border today. DHS Secretary, uh, DHS Secretary Nielsen announced a deal with Mexico to overhaul the asylum process and combat catch and release. Secretary Nielsen was on Capitol Hill today to discuss the agreement, where she was confronted by Democratic Congressman Luis Gutierrez. You won't believe what he had to say. There's one thing that this administration done better than any other administration in American history, and that is lie. It is repugnant to me and astonishing to me that during Christmas, I like to call them the holiday seasons to be inclusive, but during Christmas, because the majority always wants to just call it Christmas, that during Christmas, a time in which we celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ, a Jesus Christ who had to flee for his life with Mary and Joseph. Thank God there wasn't a wall that stopped him from seeking refuge in Egypt. Thank God that wall wasn't there. And thank God there wasn't an administration like this or he would have too have perished. <laughs> well, I didn't even respond to that. Here to discuss this and more, Campus Reform Editor-in-Chief Lawrence Jones, the author of the best-selling book, Jesus is Risen, Attorney David Limbaugh, who, full disclosure, has done some legal work for me, and former federal attorney Emily Campagno. Thanks all for joining us. Lawrence, I'll go to you first. Uh, you notice how he had, had to get the PC talking point oh, in there, yeah. too? Uh, uh, Christmas? Christmas? But it's the holiday season, too, for all the, the PC folks out there. But isn't this just another disingenuous argument by a liberal Democrat? They cite religion when it's convenient, yet yeah. when it comes to social issues, they'll attack you endlessly. They never love Jesus until it's time to make some political argument. You know, the interesting thing about this is that uh, none of these people are advocating for life uh, from conception. All these abortions that take place, they get thousands and thousands of dollars from Planned Parenthood to make sure there's laws to protect. I mean, <coughs> it's completely decimated my community. And, and by the way, the story of Jesus, he went to die for our sins. That is the story about Jesus. He was born to for our sins, you know, and to go on the cross. Yeah, the congressman so, missed a few details. Yeah, he doesn't, yeah, exactly. So, uh, obviously, he doesn't read the Bible. He's only using it for his political agenda. Well, David, no better person to have on given your book. <laughs> but uh, you know what I find incredibly disingenuous about this as well? Not just the use of religion conveniently for Democrats. It's also the compassion angle he thinks he's trying to take, while he ignores the fact that the United States has been the most generous country on earth when it comes to legal immigrants. We just ask that you come here legally. This is entirely disingenuous this is such demagoguery dan it, did you see the stunning disrespect he showed uh, for yeah. secretary nielsen yeah, i've never out. seen uh, liberals are liberals are supposed to respect women he called right. her a liar he called her remorseless and he walked out right after he'd asked her a question when she started talking he talks about her being a liar because she supposedly uh, said that we don't uh, file, we don't separate children well, we don't. That's not the policy. The policy is to enforce the law, and he knows that. This is pure 
uh, liberal demagoguery and propaganda, and their purpose is to demonize Republicans as racist and as heartless, and it's shameless what they're doing. You know, Emily, I, I don't know if you saw that, but he, he, it was unbelievably disrespectful. The congressman, while DHS Secretary Nielsen was talking, gets up and leaves. Uh, it re, uh, David, you pointed out it was really grotesque uh, to watch. But Emily, from your perspective, uh, being an attorney, this policy, this so-called separation of children policy, because it's not a policy, is actually a 2015 policy, the Flores Consent Decree. Uh, th this is not new to Donald Trump. We cannot hold these children in detention for, I believe, it to be more than 20 days. I, I don't even understand what they're suggesting. Uh, what are they suggesting? We detain children for more than 20 days? Have you heard any serious proposals to combat this from the Democrats? No, exactly. And that's why I have such an issue with this. Frankly, it's the tip of the iceberg. My issue with Rep Gutierrez, who has been wasting our taxpayer dollars for the 25 years that he has served in Congress. So during that time, not only does he clearly not know the law, as you just said, but he's taken no steps to articulate it or to afford specificity both for our citizens or those seeking asylum. In his grandstanding in front of Secretary Nielsen, he said those who are fearing for their lives nebulously or from sickness, which obviously has no part in a discussion on the actual laws. I want to point out for viewers as well that this winner in those 25 years sponsored only four bills that were enacted.